Good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to preface my presentation by thanking the TEDx NC State team for doing such a great job at being encouraging and highly, highly organized. And I'd also like to ask you a simple question. Do you enjoy watching the news? Yeah, no. no. Oftentimes, it's quite discouraging, isn't it? Because as we've heard before, that there are many, many challenges facing our little blue marble. We're looking at, well, you know about climate change and how that is primarily being caused by <laughs> CO2 emissions from power plants, from cement industries, and from steel industries. And we know the symptoms, the wildfires throughout the world. We know about drought conditions and the opposite of drought conditions, the flood conditions. And we know about the superstorms that have hit the east coast of the US as well as Eastern Asia. And lastly, we can't forget, of course, the ice caps melting, right? And we have the doomsday glacier to give us an indication of when the height of the ocean is going to change and when the currents are going to change because all of that fresh water dumped into a saline ocean. But we have other challenges. For example, we have to be concerned with food security now. And because of all of the chemical dumping into many of our water systems, we have to deal with water security. Well, if you start taking away the basics of human existence, then we have problems with international security. Now, all of these are problems, challenges, that we can see. There's one on this chart that we cannot see. And that's the one I'm going to talk about. Because this one we've had experience with over the last few years. This is the one that caused the aliens to be killed in War of the Worlds. And this is the one that can really cause significant horrors as we have encountered over the past few years. Yes, I'm talking about microbes. And we've all had experience with this. COVID-19 was a horrible, horrible experience. So many lives needlessly lost. And I'm sure we all have, had, we all have our tragedy stories. But you know the secret behind this is that it's not the biggest problem. This was an acute problem. The chronic problem deals with something called antimicrobial resistance. The pandemic lasted a few years. Antimicrobial resistance is still on the rise. It's evolutionary which means that every day certain microbes are becoming increasingly more resistant to the drugs that were previously used to treat them. Now, when I first saw this headline, I thought, no. Superbugs being a greater problem than COVID? What's a superbug? Well, superbug, nightmare bug, these are the ways the media likes to refer to these types of microbes that have developed some kind of drug resistance. And if you think that these two concepts are uncoupled, no, they're not. They're coupled because we know that there have been more infections due to these antimicrobial resistant microbes during the pandemic. So what, what is there to do about this? Well, first, we need to get, get a quick understanding of what these superbugs are all about. And so we can thank the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for all these wonderful different uh, descriptions, classifications of microbes. The one that you see here is a very common one. It's called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And if you don't like saying all that, you can refer to it as the media does as MRSA. And MRSA accounts for about 10,000 
deaths per year and costs the US healthcare industry over a billion dollars. Ah, but wait, the best part? These numbers are from 2017. So it gives you an indication of the burden that this has, not only in terms of monetary usage, but also in terms of lives lost. More so, you might think, oh, this can't happen in the US. Oh, indeed it can. In fact, if you look at this map, oh, I'm sorry, you wanted to see some infections? <laughs> yes, well, that's what a MRSA infection looks like. They're not pleasant, and they often require last resort antibiotics. And if those don't work, amputation. So let's get rid of these because they're not fun to look at. But let's go ahead and think about where MRSA occurs. And you'll notice from the red here that, yeah, the US has its fair share of MRSA, as well as South America, Western Europe, Australia. And don't be fooled by the others because oftentimes the numbers simply aren't reported. Now you might think, wow, MRSA is really horrible. I'm gonna show you one that's not just a serious threat, it's an urgent threat. And that's called C. difficile. And for those of you who have had loved ones who went into a hospital and acquired C. difficile, you have my condolences. Because this kills about the same number of people per year, again, 2017 numbers, costs about the same amount in terms of a financial burden on the healthcare system, but it targets, it targets older people who have been treated with antibiotics. And unfortunately, the numbers say that if that happens, chances of survival, about 15%. So if we start putting all the numbers together, we're looking at well over, and again, 2017 numbers, well over 3 million cases per year in the US alone. Now, I really hate just looking at numbers. I'm an engineer. I love working with numbers. But when it comes to talking about people's lives and uh, infection cases, I do not like talking about numbers because each number corresponds to a human life. I'm going to introduce you to one of those. This is my mother, who went into a hospital for a diabetes infection, and she never came out. She contracted C. difficile and was dead within six days. So it gives you an indication just how dangerous some of these microbes are. So what can we do? Well, we can take the advice of the World Health Organization. Clean care is safer care. So how can we clean in a more effective way? Well, there are lots of different approaches. And being a materials person, I'm interested in these over here. So we could make surfaces more hydrophilic, more water loving, so that microbes simply don't see them. Or we could add in metal or metal oxide nanoparticles. It sounds really high tech, it is. But the problem there is that these particles can lose their toxicity over time. And they can enter into the food chain. So you could start consuming them. If we turn to singlet oxygen here, oh, singlet oxygen? No, oxygen is O2. Uh, no, not necessarily. If we put a particular type of dye into a material, and expose it to visible light in the presence of air, it'll produce singlet oxygen, which is very corrosive. It's almost like bleach. And this works quite well, and we have two of the world leading experts here at NC State in this field, Professors Reza Galati and Frank Scholl. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about charged polymers, soft materials. You think of these as plastics or rubbery materials. And it turns out that 
when we start looking at this, we have one important goal in mind, and that is to come up with a rapid, comprehensive way of cleaning surfaces. So, I would love to stand before you and say, we had the foresight to be able to come up with this great new material. We didn't. This is where serendipity played an important role because this graduate student, who went by STP, not standard temperature and pressure, uh, but he found serendipitously by adding in a photosensitive dye into this particular polymer, which has water-loving units and water-hating units, he found that when he put, when he started looking at controls, the controls killed all the microbes. Well, needless to say, he went back and repeated it and repeated it and repeated it. And after we were convinced, we had to start thinking about why. And that took us months. What we found was that this material likes to form what's called a nanostructure. And this structure exists on the order of tens of nanometers. And for those of you who are not metric oriented, a nanometer is one millionth of a millimeter. So it gives you an idea that these guys are really tiny and the dark ones that you see here are hydrophilic. They're water loving. And in the presence of water, protons from this acidic group right here start to migrate to the surface. And when they do so, they make the surface acidic. How acidic, you might ask? How about a pH of 0.8 to 0.9, which is more acidic than your stomach acid? Now, this is not gonna hurt you and me because we have this really uh, thick layer of dead skin. So we can touch this, you wouldn't feel anything. I wouldn't go around licking it, but it works. How well does it work? These are the results from IRSA. Each one of these log units corresponds a decade in terms of killing. So this would be 100%, which is what we start with. This would be 90%, 99, 99.9, .9, and so forth and so on. And you can see that within five minutes, this material has killed 99.9999% of all the MRSA. Now, how does this compare against something that we're all used to, like a, sanit a sanitation wipe or a disinfectant wipe? This gets to 99.99% in two minutes. That's pretty good. But there are two problems with it. One is that this is a point in time solution, which means that it has to be applied and then reapplied and so forth. So it doesn't keep the surface clean. The other point, this contributes to solid waste. And by doing so, we now have a new problem that is associated with the COVID pandemic, which no one likes to talk about, and that is the extraordinary increase in the amount of solid waste due to personal protection equipment as well as wipes. So, does this work for something other than MRSA? Sure. We use a number of different bacteria that are commonly associated with hospital-acquired infections. They are referred to as the escape family, not escape, if you're familiar with Finding Nemo. And what each of the letters corresponds to each one of these different bacteria. I'm only going to show you the results from the gram-negative bacteria because these are harder to kill. But after five minutes, we get the same level of inactivation. And that is dictated by our minimum detection limit. We can't detect anything beyond that. So these could actually be better than 99.9999%. Well, what about the big bad? The big bad is C. diff, right? So we collaborated with a specialist at Kansas State, Ravathi Govind, and look at what we find. There is 
the 99.9999% right there, and we achieve it in five minutes for two different strains of C. difficile, one that is considered hypervirulent, which means it's incredibly dangerous. And if you want to see what these look like when they're being uh, killed, my current graduate student, Ms. Casey Wells, has performed electron microscopy to show this is what a healthy, I hate to use that word with C. difficile, but it is, uh, and this is after five minutes. Only thing that's left is a corpse. All of the interior material has been removed. How many of you would like to see what happens to MRSA? Anybody? Yeah. Initial time, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes. We couldn't <coughs> find very many cells that were even left. These were essentially dissolved and all we found were the interior aspects. Now, I mentioned earlier we want a comprehensive material. That means not antibacterial. It has to be antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. And that's where a lot of other technologies fail. Well, we all know SARS-CoV-2, the culprit for the COVID pandemic, and we also know that we were taught by the CDC that it is transmitted primarily by coughing or sneezing through the introduction of water droplets or aerosols. And those droplets land on surfaces and the virus can stay active for several days. And that's including face masks. Isn't that a horrible consideration? But the idea behind what we've done is to take those virus particles once they hit the surface and kill them. Does it work? This is Professor Anthony Griffiths from the National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratories up at Boston University. He performed the tests with SARS-CoV-2, five minutes, reached the minimum detection limit. So we know this works. We know it also works against other viruses like human adenovirus, which might give you some gut uh, discomfort. Or how about flu? It works. In fact, this works so well against viruses that in 2021, the EPA granted emergency approval for use of this material in Delta airline terminals throughout the US. So if you flew on Delta and you used a ticket counter or a ticket kiosk and you touched it, your fingers were being disinfected without you even knowing it. So, in closing, what have we achieved? This type of material is rapid, less than five minutes, effective, at least 99.9999% kill, comprehensive. I didn't show you results for fungi, but it kills black mold. It kills candida, for those of you who are familiar with those fungi. It's self-sterilizing. We don't have to put anything in this material. And it's continuous. It works for two months in many cases, and then it can be replaced. It's reusable, it can be recharged, and it can be recycled. Most importantly, it, can be non, it is non-specific. It doesn't target like pharmaceuticals. So microbes cannot develop any kind of resistance. So in closing, I've taken you into the world of microbes, and I hope I've given you a glimpse as to another challenge that we face as a species. But I hope I've also given you that there's hope. And some of that hope comes from the work that we've done here in terms of developing it, this broad spectrum antimicrobial polymer. And we're trying to basically show that we can live up to the mantra of NC State of thinking and doing the extraordinary. Thank you very much for your attention.